Welcome everyone to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host, and with me for all of these Bad Batch episodes is Kyle Gould. That's me. <laughs> and we're back for episodes seven and eight, Bad Territory and The Harbinger. But before we get into those episodes, I did want to sort of talk about one thing, which is uh, my good friends over at Scavengers Horde have taken down their shingle as a podcast and have decided to go on permanent hiatus life and other reasons rachel of course one of the scavengers horde um i did a panel at celebration with a celebration europe you got to meet her and hang out with her what a lovely human being yeah and i've also met Kirsty in real life as well, which is which is wild. So I know both of them and uh, really well. And I am sad to hear that they have um, they've decided to go on hiatus. I know life can get in the way of doing this thing that's really just a hobby for many, many people. Well, you know, it just means that they've moved on to other things. Yeah. And when one chapter ends a new chapter begins and that doesn't mean that the previous chapter has any negative connotations associated with it it might not have been as long a chapter as we might have wanted it to be but it was still just as good a part of the book and i love speaking personally with both kirsty and rachel there um two of my favorite people they were big sequel trilogy sequel era fans were really into understanding the themes and analyzing the text for more and they will be missed in the community at large um well their their contribution to the community at large was was deeply felt um gosh okay so like all the things i've said so far are all stuff i've put in retirement cards at work (laughs) so if you work in an office all of that stuff (laughs) is literal gold you want to see a person weep for leaving those are the things to say just those things no but i I will miss them and having their insights uh, out there it it feels more lonely having lost two powerful women in podcasting right but they're the cool thing about these podcasts is they don't go away. No, still be you can there. still go and, and listen to them, which is also really great, too. Yeah. And I hope to have either one of them on the podcast on What the Force. I've been on their podcast, but or no, maybe I haven't been on their podcast. They have quoted me on their podcast, which was an experience. But, uh, you know, Rachel and I, of course, collaborated for Celebration. So I think... I will be reaching out to them and see if they're interested in ever, ever guesting on what the force. It sounds like a really lovely thing to do. Um, and yes, everywhere else is it. We don't, we won't have their voices going forward, but the, the this is labor. It is. We don't yeah. look at it any other way. It's unpaid labor. And the only reason you do it is for the enjoyment of the work itself. Yep. And exactly. If and you don't enjoy the work anymore don't do it yeah mad respect to anyone who podcasts it's a lot in any form yeah especially those unsung unheard podcasts when fewer people listen to them it's a lot harder to it's more of a labor of love yeah (laughs) yeah yeah but fundamentally you do it for yourself and as soon as it stops working that's when it's time to pause but that's not the case for what the force (laughs) congratulations on your sixth anniversary marie claire it was two months ago. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> we're speaking of, of things ending oh. and things continuing. It's it's nice to tell you you are an inspiration in this household with the longevity oh. and the commitment that you've had to this podcast and your other endeavors and pursuits. Yeah, I was speaking with uh, Christy Carew actually yesterday about the podcast and she, uh, she, <laughs> we were also talking about life and I was, you know, mentioning that Robin's going into their last year of high school and <laughs> Christy said, isn't Robin 11? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it's been, it's been a long time that uh, we've been podcasting and that I've known Christy, I've known Ty for a really long time. Alex Kane, who's been on the podcast a lot, Missy. It's it's just, you know, you you end up building really, really strong friendships with people who you collaborate with and you're able to share the love of something with. And absolutely. Yeah. So few people truly know what it means to pod, you know, discuss the meta aspects and the 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 underlying motifs of Star Wars. <laughs> and so So many fewer people than that are interested in talking on a microphone to themselves most of the time and very rarely to another person um, about it. Mm -hmm. So 
<laughs> yeah, it's true. Although um, there is a YouTuber slash person personality on Twitter named Maury Mole who has been doing some amazing tweet threads about the Jungian archetypes inside of Bad Batch. And I've been messaging and just giving praise because one of the things I one of my goals when I started this podcast was to hear more voices like this or more people talking about Star Wars in this way was to because I couldn't find podcasts that talked about Star Wars in this way. Mm -hmm. I still can't find too many of them. So I still feel like a rarity. But the more I talk, hopefully I inspire somebody else to pick it up. <laughs> so Thank you for listening to me over all these years, encouraging me. And as a listener of the Bad Batch Report, listening to us and our and our wacky conversation. <laughs> I'm here for it. Yeah. Thanks to the Scavenger Horde for all you did and all you've done. But let's go on to the Bad Batch Report. Excellent. So uh, any major things that you've noticed? Well, I want to get it out episodes. of the way very beginning. So it's two episodes. Mm hmm. Uh, and I would like to combine death count into a single moment here. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. Uh, reporting count. live, this is death count here, where we're getting we're getting a tabulation. Zero people died, right? And nothing died. No, no droids. <clears throat> a I tentacle. A single tentacle has died. If that tentacle was sentient, like Doctor Octopus's, Doctor Octavius's tentacles, then. They're individually, te they're individually. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> You're stretching it. I okay. <laughs> literally went to the point where I started looking at a, a new segment called Ships Landing. Um, <laughs> but then it was, it, it, that segment is about as boring a feeling as you just had right there as it is watching all of these ships land in all of these episodes. <laughs> why? Star Wars, Why? I feel like there are certain things that are requirements for the theme and the tone of Star Wars in quotation marks mm, and like mm -hmm, certain mm -hmm. old school um, Photoshop wipes, star wipes and vertical yeah. horizontal wipes and vertical wipes and the, the classic wipes. Uh, like fade in where it goes to the circle. And that's where we get the one shot of C-3PO's head. Yes. There's not as many of those as there are of They're these rare. Just other. They're special, but like the yeah, the Ugh. wipes, yeah, and yeah. they are all very antiquated types of transitions. Transitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's so many of them because there's so many different shots, especially when they move from one scene to the next. Anyway, I feel like ships landing are a requirement. Like that, anytime <laughs> somebody goes to a new planet or goes somewhere else, you ha you are required. It's like part of the. It's how they show the world building is the ship lands. It, no, it's not even I mean, that anymore. Okay, there was, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was something where they didn't show a ship's landing and it felt so weird. Oh, it was the Rise of Skywalker. Mm. And it was like, because they were already like, I don't know, they the editing on that one is super weird and you can't really tell where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't put up Hoth or anything. They don't, no. put, they don't give you those things, but rarely. And yeah. they Only give you in, the ship in landing. in Andor and in uh, Rogue One. Do they actually name? I think they the actually planets? did that a couple of times in in Bad Batch. There's might oh, be a really? couple of episodes oh, where they actually name the place. I thought they did that with Ord Mantel in maybe. the first time they went there. Mm, maybe, but it doesn't matter. What does matter is there are so many ship landings in this. Did you actually count this... them, or did you give up? No, I got bored and okay. stopped. <laughs> You're like, can I replace Death Count with something? No, when, it's not more interesting. When they go to meet Fennec, the ship yeah. lands. Mm -hmm. We don't need to see that. We don't even, we just see the ship land and then the gate, the door, the, the, the runway open. That's all we get. And then, and we've seen the ship so many times, why? And then when they go with Fennec, we see the ship land. Mm -hmm. And then when Fennec leaves, we see, see her ship leave. There's just all of this. There was a lot of ships, yes. I did like the space station because that's like an old clone wars space station i like that yes that arrival was really mm -hmm. cool at that space station was great and the bar what a bar yeah like that you want i want to go to that bar served by pit droids who are willing to like smash people over the head with a bottle who are getting into a bar fight that give me that i want i wanted more of that 
We did not get it. We didn't, know. But we did get Fennec interacting with that poor Rodian. <laughs> yes, that was also great. <laughs> Dickering about <clears throat> price or whatever. <laughs> no, about um, you have to tell, I'm paying you so that you make sure that you tell him or her, I can't remember which, uh, it was me that did it. Oh, you yeah. Ha- yeah, like yeah, it yeah, has yeah. To, and she's like, I don't care. And he's like, no, I'm paying you to do that. And she's like, I don't care. And then he had to leave. And he's like, what? This is... I'm a paying customer. (laughs) And they're like, yeah. Uh, It feels like it feels like Hunter and Wrecker are totally out of their depths when dealing with Fennec. I think everyone is out of their depths when dealing with Fennec. Yeah. Even the Mandalorian himself, Din Djarin, was out of his depth dealing with Fennec. I I think that there is a reason she is who she is and that there the reason ming na wen was hired to be that voice is because of the type of person and character she portrays Mm -hmm. which is don't mess with me yeah there's a certain amount of gravitas that she brings even just with her voice and the character which is really great and no nonsense Mm -hmm. just no nonsense whatsoever I do want to point out, and this will be more important kind of when I get to the second episode, but Fennec is also representative of another psychopomp, mm-hmm. which is a fox. Spirit foxes are a thing across Asia, Asia, as well as they're known as tricksters. Um, she also represents another type of dark mother, um, which we've experienced previously with Omega. And there's a... a How is she a dark mother? It had to do with Omega and the interactions from last season. Oh, okay. In that. In this episode, she is not any of those things. No. No, but in relation to Omega, she is one. Cool. So mm. let's stay on the, the Fennec chant because there's two stories. There's the A plot and the B plot with yeah. Crosshair and Omega yeah. back on the base, which is, there's not much. It's just no. a way to segue back and forth. Um, Very point A to point B episode that this was. Absolutely just... <clears throat> Absolutely just a, you know, fetch quest. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Absolutely. Like 100%. I guess. Which was, and it was sad too, because we did get some more development of Fennec and we kind of got to see how things are going. But so much time was spent on developing and putting this in place that I didn't feel like Hunter and Wrecker really got any character development again mm, yeah, on no. their own. Like they're just still single, single icon individuals, exactly their name. I wreck stuff and I'm a hunter. I hunt stuff and I wreck stuff. Yeah. Um, but a couple of things I want to do. First, would you like to play a game? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so it is the very first time that any of the, that this has been mentioned ever is class A bounty hunters. Did you know that there are rankings now? There's According rankings? to Star Wars. Is this new? Bounty. Yes, this term, Class A Bounty Hunters, comes from this episode when Fennec says the Empire has tasked or hired or sent out to class a bounty hunters to track down these m count individuals oh my god look at the world building jennifer and brad just a subtle comment (laughs) yeah but now everybody needs to now everybody wants to know who are class a bounty hunters I mean, obviously, all the ones that are on Vader's ship in Empire Strikes Back that are going after the Millennium Falcon. Is that what leads to that? I don't know. Maybe. So. No disintegrations, Kyle. I did some research. Okay. And and people people can play along as well. You can figure out who is not on this list that you think should be on this list. But if you were to put together a list of, say, 10 or 12 class a bounty hunters Mm -hmm. who are essentially the best of the best although i don't know like because there's a there's cba and then oftentimes a lot of systems have s tier right tier like super (laughs) duper tier so let's just say there's no s tier this is just top of the top the cream of the cream and you know i'm such a fan of bounty hunters i know right (laughs) not at all (laughs) i would like to know how many can you name in the top 10 or 12. So I'll give you a whole bunch to name Are people off. ranking them or is this something that has been has, has come out? Look. <laughs> Are you ranking them? There's a whole world of Star Wars out there okay. that we don't pay much attention to. And they rank 
bounty hunters. Many people have ranked oh, bounty Lord, hunters. Oh, Lord. But it's a, like at this time, years. Alpha, i.e., Boba Fett, is not very old. Okay, so I'm just saying across all time. Okay. So, so just fine. the entire oeuvre of Star Wars. Okay. All of it, comic books. I don't know if I know whatnot. all of the bounty yeah. hunters. So who are the top 10 most amazing bounty hunters in Star Wars? Ventress. Boba Fett. Asajj Ventress is on that list. Yes. Asajj Ventress, Boba Fett. Boba Fett. Cat Bane. Is, oh, you're going too fast. Boba Fett is assuredly on that list. In fact, oftentimes ranked number one on that list. Fine. I think that has a lot more to do with EU stuff and potentially just street cred. Absolutely. So, yes, Asajj Ventress oftentimes comes in at fourth. Boba Fett, number one. Uh, Cad Bane. Cad Bane, oftentimes number three or number two on the Not list. Not surprised. Hey, top three, right? You, yeah. You, well, you're close. Ish. You're missing one other person in the top three. Aura Singh. Who? Our Our Singh. Aura Singh is usually in the lower end of the tens and elevens well, okay, or fine, nines. Top ten. Fine. But definitely considered one of the craziest ones of like, don't get in her way. You know, and I don't remember mm -hmm. all their names, but there's the guy with the cool helmet hat thing that slides down the hill in the Clone Wars. Ah, uh, yes. You are talking about Embo. Embo, yeah. And Embo is one of them as well. You are now at five of the top ten named Bounty Bounty Hunters. Hunters. Yes. What about Mandalorian? I mean, uh, Din Djarin. Din Djarin is on that okay. list as well. Fine. Yes, Din Djarin has made the list. And actually, if you look at season one, Dude's a stone cold, straight oh, up collector. Oh of no, people. no, no! He's great. He's he's got his skills, and then he gets all soft hearted for a yep. squishy green little dude goblin. Um, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> all right, four more. Uh, IG eighty eight. Yes, absolutely. Usually in the tenth or ninth rank, Din Djarin slips ahead of him. But yes, IG eighty eight definitely in there. Um, I'm raking my Clone Wars bounty hunter episode. Uh, knowledge. I'm trying to remember all of them. Uh, you just have two left, two or three, really. <clears throat> Obi Wan is a bounty hunter. <laughs> I love that he was not. He did not make the list, but he was pretending to be a bounty hunter right? for a while. Yeah, no, that's very fair. That's that's very astute. Did not make many. Did not make any lists. Boo. Um. Would you Bosk. like it? Bosk is not on the list. Not once, only on a list of all of the bounty hunters did Bosk make the list. Boo. Sure. I, I You are missing is the it guy obvious? whose face you are watching all the time on this television show that we are currently discussing. And the reason why his face is everywhere. Oh. <laughs> Django Fett Django is Fett. on the list. Of Absolutely. Course. Yes. Okay, fine. All I right. mean, I just like <clears throat> I forgot. <laughs> that's funny one or two more um okay one you might not have gotten Can you give me a hint is, well one you might have gotten not have gotten is cage vanda is he from she the, she's from the clone wars no she is a twi'lek who kind of lies to a jedi and the jedi goes around and collects a whole bunch of bounties and when the jedi's price on his head gets high enough she finally goes well buddy i guess you're finally worth turning in i i don't know who this is it's from jedi survivor oh really yes i never finished that plot line oh no so she goes and okay yeah cuz it wasn't it was optional where you Absolutely. go and get collect all the bounties oh she's fun i like her Sorry, I th my brain was not thinking video games. But uh, yeah, no, I only did a couple of those bounties because I was more interested in the main plot because I had to finish it to record it with Ty. That's fair. So we also have Fennec Shand. Oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't even you mention her. Made the list. I should have made the list. And then one yeah. more who I know you know, and I can understand why you've forgotten him. No hints. But it, well, he's big. He's big? He doesn't talk much. He doesn't talk much? Yeah. He's, uh, he's darker furred. Oh, it's Kersai. It's Black Kerstan. Whoa, name. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> he was really good in the Mandal or the Boba Fett. Book of Boba Fett. Yeah. yeah. But he's actually from the comics. And I, I could never pronounce his name yeah. in the comics because I have a reading disability. There's double R's between the K and the S. Kerstan. Kersantan. Kersantan. 
even I can't pronounce it. And I'm Black looking at the croissants? name. Yes, you can call him that from now on if that's what you'd like. <laughs> anyway, if you feel that there are people who are bounty hunters that are of all across the Star Wars universe that you did not that did not make this list, my Discord have, is going to have opinions. I would love to read those opinions. <laughs> I did okay. You can at me. You named all. You you actually got through a ten. Remember there was twelve, so you did great. Good job. I, I'm I'm very impressed. I mean. It wasn't Star Wars Trivial Pursuit. It's not ordering 20 seasons of Survivor according to Logo, but you know what? You can have an extra vote at Tribal. I mean, I could easily order all the movies according to Logo by timeline order. I don't doubt you could have. Yeah. That would be easy. There's not that many of them. What you have to do is name all... uh, order all the characters who've actually celebrated life days <laughs> and the number of life days they've celebrated in order that would be like would be just really showing good. up at the festival because yeah. then are are we including the star wars holiday special in that or is it not included because it's not canon i don't know okay. that's, that's up to you and and because other... luke and han did make it to the to the festival <laughs> well there you go <laughs> so that was my little game uh, yeah, that when was she cute. mentions I loved it. class A bounty hunters. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then we go on this whole thing. And I, I'll, I'll just jump in with my thoughts here on the okay. whole reason. Because I initially was very puzzled that Fennec was passing on the name of a bounty hunter that the Bad Batch would pay for information. And that was going to cost them. All she had to do was just give them a name and a contact details. And that was going to cost them. I was so puzzled by mm. that on the first watch. It seemed so trite. Mm-hmm. Like it it seemed like you're writing with the end in sight. And I know that's important, but also like you need to pay attention to the moments as they're happening. Yeah, it was a little weird. Yeah. And then I realized, yeah, Fennec is going to charge them a ton of money For because the person she's talking about is dead. is not just dead, but like highly, you know, She's like water. You never know which way she's going to go. Yeah. You don't know if this is going to piss her off. Her telling these bounty hunters, hey, yeah, just reach out to Asajj Ventress. She knows all about this because she was one of the class A bounty hunters that they they, <laughs> they requested this information of. She said no, but she knows more about it. Yeah, okay. I can see why she'd want <laughs> to like charge them an, like an arm and a leg. <clears throat> she probably doesn't even go by her name anymore. I mean anonymity is like king right yeah she didn't call herself that and they called her that when they were anyway yeah that's, just getting the heart the cart ahead of the course uh, the cart ahead of the horse there the episode eight ahead of the episode seven exactly because this one's <laughs> called bad territory which is maybe the worst naming of the entire season so far yeah i have not been able to figure this one out i really liked silar Saris as a like cool insectoid uh-huh like bad guy who who is really hard to get because he's basically just built himself like an impenetrable impen- booby trapped swamp by you exactly <laughs> i like i loved all of the like this is florida vibes about everything in this so episode southern united states this guy's got his own little <laughs> lock away from the Ar- armageddon component here <laughs> and and the funny thing was we were watching it and i could barely see much on the tv last week when we first watched it we need to watch it in the dark you have apparently. To, exactly middle of the day on a sunny bright sun-filled day with a ground full of snow that's reflecting all the light right in through our four windows in the main room like (laughs) not the best scenario to watch dark tv on but i was like that looks like a trap door i I felt like somebody was gonna fall in there like it was a pit trap or whatnot Mm -hmm. no it's his way of escaping Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um i was a little disappointed though yeah i really wanted him to talk yeah he says nothing until he says fennec's name like not enough. Not like why he's he's like, why are you here? Hey, you get, leave me alone. I, I'll blow you guys up. Why have a conversation? He should have been all gloaty. <clears throat> he was kind of an anno- annoying little dude. Yes, but <laughs> he's he's a terrible person. Like, oh, he no, I know. He took out an entire syndicate family. Yeah, that's why he's wanted. Yep. Fennec stands to make millions off of him from the bad guys, the syndicate. Mm-hmm. Oh, I couldn't remember their names for the moment. There's um. Played by that wonderful, amazing performer, Angela, and nope, Angela, Angelica Huston. Angelica Houston, yeah. Played by Angelica Houston. And I'm like, 
This is that's the lady who's hired Fennec Shand to take out this guy. Really? It has to be oh, because no, no, no. It's a different group. No, no, no. It the whole. Why wouldn't it be the whole group? Why wouldn't it be her? It was part of the syndicate. She's part of the syndicate. He took really? out. He took out a space station and an entire family. Oh, is that how they're looping it back? Okay, uh, that's how it seems to me to be the case. Uh, I don't remember. But I don't think we're ever going to get to see it anyway. So it doesn't mm. really matter. It just seems like it's another nugget of this is a bigger picture than you know. But we don't really know why these things are occurring mm-hmm. in the background. The relevancy here is that you bad batchers had, are not going to get paid at all. You're going to risk your lives. Mm-hmm. You're going to do all this. And then I am going to maybe give you a name. <laughs> so this classifies as a, as a mini night sea journey because they go in they're on a boat uh they're on like a little almost like airboat like that you would take through the skiff a skiff a skiff yeah it it, uh and they go into what it propelled it no it's uh so this is a whole tie through the reason why there's pit droids in the bar Mm -hmm. and then they go to that other planet the engine that drive that pilots the ship is a pod racing engine Oh, that's cool. And that's how it propels it along on top of the Aww, water. Oh, that's so cute. Yep. How cool is that? Um, but yeah, it's a mini night sea journey. And night sea journeys, of course, you know, from the earliest night sea journeys that we have in mythology are when Ra would go to sleep and journey into the underworld every night to be reborn to be the sun in the daytime. Mm-hmm. That was the like sort of that's one of the earliest motifs that we have documented of the night sea journey and it's about transformation and rejuvenation and all of those things but usually you don't find what you're looking for necessarily if you're a human going on these night sea journeys you end up learning um more about what you have to lose oh yeah especially like you're if you're a human on the journey and and horus is manning the (laughs) man in the the till yeah and raw's asleep underneath the boat and we're like well we just got to get him all the way there and you got (laughs) to fend off all the crocodiles in the water and then sobek's going to be coming and we don't know who else is going to be there (laughs) so be careful because we might end up fighting anubis and whatnot too yeah and and uh, and it, all of that is just so that you can get to the other end of the river so that Ra will wake up and be like, oh, we're here already. Time to go across the sky. <laughs> yeah. All right. See you tomorrow night. See you tomorrow night. Yeah. is like, we made it. All right, human, you can go about your life yeah, for those and so, of you that lived. <laughs> but like night sea journeys specifically are about facing the things that you fear to lose. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I can, I literally like was scratching my brain about like why the batch is like on this journey and like why it's important. And I'm like, I guess it's just the possibility that they d- went through all this effort and learn nothing. Yeah. Like that, that's the that's fear what happens that they to face. every human who does this journey to, you know, with Horus <laughs> to get raw to you the You got next nothing day. out of this. No. You did all of this work and you'd got nothing. And they have to face that like concept that like literally things will end in dust potentially for them, which mm-hmm. also makes me kind of worried for the end of the season that like, it might not be okay. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think it'll be fine for Omega because the the story is mainly about her. I don't know. I'm, I'm really struggling with what things yeah. mean right now. Well, I will tell you this. Mm-hmm. Twice in this episode, Hunter sees things before they happen. Right. So the like the mines. mines there's no like he the sees one, a broken ship and he calls a halt and sees the mine right before they crash into it. And he feels those crocodiles coming before they get there. Mm-hmm. That's relevant and important. Also, Hunter used to be fully aware of everything that was going on. And he was willing to take multiple different suggestions from a whole bunch of different people. Always was polling the rest of the group to see what their options were, what their decisions, what did Crosshair think? What did Tech think? What did Wrecker think? That was funny, Wrecker. You sit over there and think about blowing things up. up. But But he would oftentimes take all of their suggestions and then settle on a course he of seems action. very, very focused on one thing now. But he will only do one thing to the exclusion of nothing else. Mm-hmm. He and the, There's not even a discussion yeah. that Omega can't go with them. He literally says, no, Yeah, sit there, go uh, figure out what's wrong with Crosshair's hand. Oh, that'll give you something to do. And then he scoots, scooches off. It was so strange that someone he's grown to trust the opinion of who he's so afraid for, he doesn't take a moment to say, you're the thing everyone's looking for. Yeah. If we bring, if I bring you with me, as much as I know you'll help me, 
I don't think you're not, it's not going to be at, because whatever we're going to get, we don't know if it'll be of any value. Yeah, it it's doesn't. too much of a risk. Yeah, because the value is in what you mean to us and all of that. Yeah. No. Why couldn't he have just said that? I think he's going through something. <laughs> it's not clear, right? No, we have to it's... read this underneath the layers. And so much of the time is spent battling crocodiles and fighting a, a, a bounty. I wish, no, I wish there was about. more char- character moments because those are like when the show really shines when Agreed. they have they have those character moments like the second episode has a lot more of those a hundred percent moments and it's a better episode and in my the secondary opinion. moments in that episode drive character mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the secondary moments in this episode never drive character especially yeah. in our a plot the only thing we get really is the end like well, what if you never do anything for us? Yeah. And she's like, well, bye. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I did have one question, which is... Fennec- I totally thought her ship was going to turn and clip Wrecker on the way out with the wing. <laughs> Fennec in the first season was working for somebody to mm-hmm. go get uh, Omega back. Was that Nalise? I think so. think so. Yeah, because the yeah. bounty got canceled. And Nalise had decided that Omega was... Better. Better to stay... Wherever she was. Stay with... The batch. The batch. And they would protect her. And that's great. And then so she reaches out to Fennec or Fennec reaches out to Ventress and she explains the situation, et cetera. And Ventress is like, well, got to go to this weird island. I'll track these people down. They're obviously not hiding that well if she's yeah. able to find them. We're talking about Fennec? No, Ventress. Oh, I think Ventress used the force. It doesn't. We won't get to that. We, does it work that way? Yeah, I don't know if it works that way. I <laughs> let's do, talk about plot B. Yeah, let's talk about plot B. But first, I want to just jump in to say oh. that this episode was written by Matt McNivetz, oh. who is the story editor for the entire yeah. run of the show. He has actually written three, he wrote three episodes in season one, four episodes in season two. But one of those episodes was a two-part episode. So it's kind of like he wrote three again. Mm-hmm. But he has already written four episodes wow for this season three where we're eight episodes in he's written four of them wow so So, i mean he's seen the whole thing right so i just this is the end and i'm Mm -hmm. wondering how tight they want to hold on to things Mm -hmm. also this is a complicated one with regards to secondary motivation as we're talking about here like you know it's kind of filler in some ways but the reason for behind these things never really gets articulated Mm -hmm. um so it it left Nathaniel Villanueva, who is the director again, because it's part of the like, here's yours and here's yeah, yours yeah, and yeah, here's yeah, yours yeah. Of, the, of the director group. Um, left him with some great visual related stuff, but not a lot of story to work. Yeah, through. yeah. Like it was like the entire they're like, we need Fennec to provide this information and to do this thing. And here's this adventure. So, yeah, the A plot, not great, but let's go with the B plot. Yeah. Some more development of character. Mm-hmm. Sort of. AZ telling Crosshair, hey, it's not physical. Maybe it's psychological. <laughs> yep. Like what we've been saying the whole time, Kyle. Oh, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, basically Omega decides to work with Crosshair and reach out to him and connect with him and be patient with him and teaches him how to meditate. You know what I think was missing from that moment mm. when he says there's nothing you can do, but I would suggest some rehabilitation. Um, you need to give Batcher as many scritches with that hand as possible. <laughs> yeah, that would have been great. Yeah. AZ would have totally said that or Omega. Yeah. It would have been great. Crosshair would have been grumpy about it. And then he would have been like, Batcher, scritchy, scritch, scritchy, scritch. scritch. Yeah. Yes. More scritches for Batcher. The only one who scritched him is is Omega and uh, Wrecker. And I think that that is, that is too low of scritches. Right? Why doesn't Hunter have any re- interactions with Batcher? It seems like there should be. He's Hunter after all. Yeah, like man's best friend, right? Exactly. Yeah. And he's the man. And I like that they bring back that Gunji taught Omega how to meditate. I thought this part of the episode was going to play into... The second part of the episode or the second episode when I watched it, I thought that her meditating was going to play into that episode and it didn't. Yeah. And I also thought that Crosshair makes this great point that as a a, a sniper um, and it seems to be the way he sees life as well. He says close doesn't count. It's either a hit or a miss. Mm-hmm. And I was really hoping that that was a through line 
that we would see the logic of his statement kind of break down to say that close does matter. Yeah. But it hasn't come through yet. So I'm hoping that that's been a highlighted it, note it to com- say. It comes back maybe. Yeah. Mm. That close counts. It's the effort and what you give and how much you care. That's the hit, right? And it's very uh, Yoda-esque in mm-hmm. do or do not. There is no try. Right. <laughs> <laughs> At least you shot. At least you shot. Yeah. Uh, it is nice to see Crosshair so quickly fall into meditation mm-hmm. with Omega. It was um, a beautiful scene. I wanted the screenshot of that moment of them staring off into the sunset. Right. As a, it's a cro- It's a play over to another scene. Have you seen the two images overlaid with each other? There's another scene of the three um, ba- of the Bad Batch sitting together, looking out into the distance of of something else. I'll I'll try to find it for you afterwards. Okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's it. They're doing a lot of connective imagery. Staring off into the horizon is uh is about thinking about the future and what the possibilities are it always is in tv shows and whatnot hey Mm -hmm. have you ever found that in real life yeah i think that i think that i get introspective when i look at beautiful surroundings like when we went to the rockies and we went to lake mirror near or the lake moraine near um lake louise I, I just I mean, in the, the imagery, the theme, the theme of it always is, is that the character is looking to tomorrow. They're yeah. looking like into Luke the future, looking to the two suns. Right. They've, they they're they're <sighs> not looking so much as to where they are now, but where they, they want due. to be and yeah. where they are going. Yeah. But that never is the case for me in real life. For <laughs> me in real life, I'm always like, this is where I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. The thing is about uh, visual storytelling is that ha- there has to be a lot of a shorthand to right. describe what people are feeling, feeling thinking, thinking doing, yeah. you know. Yep. But it is funny to think that we all know that int- intuitively when a person sits and stares they at the stare horizon, the horizon. they're mm-hmm. thinking about where they're going to go to next. Mm-hmm. But in the reality of the world, that's when you are at your most. I am here. <laughs> I'm here in the moment when I'm looking at a beautiful sunset or yeah. sunrise or whatever. Yeah, yeah, this beautiful yeah. vista and panoply before me when I see and look into the horizon. I'm thinking about where I am, not where I'm going. Anyway, that's, that's lovely. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I, I will say the one thing that problem the problem I had with the meditation moment there was that he was like, well, how do you know this? Like, just like he had to ask the question for the reply guys just to make sure that, well, Omega does know things. She spent time on Kashyyyk with Gungji and therefore yeah. she knows how to <laughs> meditate. And I was like, yeah, did we need he that? He asks a lot of questions like who's V, who's, yeah. <laughs> you know, like he he's just getting <laughs> caught up, <laughs> Kyle. Fair liberator of ancient wonders that's what it's <laughs> what it's ex- the pirate yeah pirate <laughs> did uh, you know that it's that that's fee's fifth episode that's great yeah yeah fee also mentioned tech in that episode in 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 this episode yeah i don't think she did yep oh okay maybe it was the episode before but yeah, I don't. Tech's been mentioned in most episodes. Somebody did a count on my Discord. Oh, interesting. Tech's mentioned next episode. Oh, he's mentioned next episode. But not yeah. in this episode and not by oh. Fee. And Fee doesn't even bring him up Maybe at all. she mentioned him previously. It she mentioned be, him previously, yeah. But I was also reading a thing that says that Fee doesn't bring it up, him up at all ever since he's quote unquote died. And I honestly think that she doesn't bring him up and we don't dwell on those moments at all because they do not want everybody to be incessantly depressed about something that actually hasn't happened. This isn't uh, that type of TV they do, show. They do drop his name, drop him and he has been dropped. His name has been dropped almost yeah. every episode. So, yeah. uh, but they don't want the people that are going to be sad at his loss. Like they didn't know this is why they don't it's have, never... they don't have emotional moments. Like exactly. it's like text database or tech mentioned that or tech was good at that. Yeah. Like it's not like they dwell on those. Whereas things. like fee his potential girlfriend. Oh yeah. Doesn't bring him up because we don't need to see the sadness and crosshair doesn't bring him up because we don't need to see the sadness because this isn't that show and he's not dead. I know he's not dead. Yeah. So since we know he's not dead. <laughs> tech conspiracy. This is also irrelevant because they don't want to be maudlin and really push you into those dark feels just to have them flipped on you. That's not this type of show. Yes. Unless they completely destroy us by the end of the show. I What? Anyway. I'm bracing myself for sadness potentially. <laughs> As you should. <laughs> this Always. is Star Wars. 
All right, let's move on to episode eight, The Harbinger. What did you think of the title? Oh, I just wanted to say one thing at the end of that episode. Oh. I thought it was really good. Okay. I do want to move on to The Harbinger really quick, but at the okay. end of that meditation, it's the beeline. It was the only thing that was interesting, um, is at yeah. the end of that, there is this beautiful major, um, like it was either in C or E or something, a major uh, trumpet that came through at the end. And it literally was like, there is hope, there is promise, we're moving forward, look at how look at how things are bright and sunny for our heroes. And it was exactly like the trumpet you would hear at the end of a Star Trek The Next Generation episode when everything ends well and it's all wrapped up with a pretty bow and there's a bright positive outlook going forward in the future as the starship flies off. Oh, interesting. And there was this trumpet that was so TNG. I, I, I say, go back, listen to the last few minutes of that moment there and you will hear this Star Trek The Next Generation sort of styling Trumpet. that says like, this is this is There's good a lot moment. of French horns in Star yeah. Trek as well. Yep. So beautiful moment. <laughs> All right. Harbinger. Sure. We what did you think the of the Harbinger. title? It's it's my favorite title of the uh, entire thing so far. Yeah. Yep. A harbinger, a person or thing that announces or signals the approach of another. Yeah. That's literally what it's supposed to mean. Yeah. A, a forerunner. A forerunner. In- as it were. In Cambalinian terms, mm-hmm. this is the herald of a change or uh, a journey and can often be the catalyst for the change or the announcement of the coming change. In Star Wars, we have the best herald in A New Hope. Do you want to know who he is? Sure. R2-D2. <laughs> I mean, c 3 is there. He just doesn't really know what's going on. <laughs> Oh, my stars and goddess. <laughs> stars and garters. But, um, you know, this is a herald for who? Obviously, it's going to be Omega. Um, Kim it can't just be for Omega. It is for Omega. It has to be for everything. That's what a it is harbinger for, is. It is for every, but everything, but the herald itself is for Omega from a heroine's journey perspective, from a maiden archetype perspective, in that... You have been all about integrating all of these different aspects of yourself so far, all of your brother fathers <laughs> into yourself, yes. all the different pieces. But now it's time for you to process all of that and move into individualization, which is, of course, symbolic of puberty and growing up into adulthood. Yeah. That's what that is. Interesting thought, though. Yeah. Point, interesting point is that a harbinger, if it is a thing... Oftentimes, a har- like a harbinger is the robin, which comes to preclude the, the beginning of spring. Right. So you see a robin, a robin is the harbinger of spring. Yes, so it's before. there's all of these, these things that bring forth, the call, that, the call to notice that change is upon us. Mm-hmm. However, when it's just a thing, it's just, there's no positive or negative connotation in regards to it. Like the letter for um, Harry Potter. Exactly. Well, okay, but when a harbinger is a person, mm-hmm. the connotation of the word is almost universally bad. Yes. So if a person is a harbinger, yes, bad things are coming. Yes. And then, so we get the title, the harbinger. Yeah. And it immediately shows us Pabu. Yes. And I'm wondering if you noticed the difference in Pabu. Yeah. No, because Pabu. But I've been is, thinking a lot about it. again how Pabu looks exactly like Tantus. I've been like I tweeted that oh, out yeah. last, or I brought it up last season. But yeah. So every time until this one, when we see Pabu, beautiful sunny day is dark, calm seas, right. gorgeous out, lovely, gorgeous, beautiful sunny sunlit vistas, and when we open on Pabu. It is overcast, gray, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. drizzling. The light is flat and colorless. Everything is gray. There's mists on the water and everything is clouded and obfuscated. That's what we open on. And I'm wondering how many people caught that because when they they have been literally shown Pabu at the start, beautiful island, nice little ring. It's yeah, Pabu. Yeah, yeah, Everybody's yeah. happy there. And we it are finally being didn't shown. Look the same. Yeah. Pabu is covered in rain and, and, and a storm to come. Foul weather is upon us. 
Because previously, Pabu represented the lap of the goddess, i.e. this place of safety and security. And all of a sudden, it's like, Ventress arrives, and it's not great weather, and also it's not secure anymore, and all of that. Um, I... <sighs> This episode is really, really great from a symbolic perspective, from an exploration of uh, Ventress's character, from Omega's character, from the Batch's character. But like the question posed by the show is, what is M count and why does it matter? And it sort of never really answers that question other than to say, as my friend, oh my God, James on Twitter said, what is M count? Well, it's the count of M. (laughs) Like, it doesn't really, yeah. it never gets to why that matters because it actually doesn't in the writer's minds, I don't think. It's how many times you've defeated Magneto. <laughs> House of M count. Uh, no, but like, it, it, it doesn't seem to matter to the writers, the question. They sort of gloss over the, you got a lot of M count if you're good with the force, mm-hmm. but you still need to train. And they, they almost like struggle with the terminology. And I totally agree. That's something that like some of my friends were talking about on Twitter. And it's like that part doesn't really matter to the writers, I guess. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like, did you get that impression as they kind of struggled with the that part of the terminology? Yeah, there was a thing that Ventress said, and I was just trying to find it in my notes um, when she's talking about the M count. And it was force potential and tapping into the force are different things. Mm -hmm. And that having a high M count does mean that you might have an easier time tapping into the force. But those two things are not interrelated the way we think they are. Interesting. Yeah. And it, it ties into that new way of thinking about anyone and everyone can use the force. Yeah. Um, and that's how we, we justify and get to Sabine finally finding a way to you to to tap into and connect to the force mm-hmm. despite having not a high m count and so so, so asajj is just reiterating this new knowledge to us to say you do not have to have a high m count in order to tap into the force the force is around us and through us and lives in mm-hmm. all of us it is if and and people think having a high m count people believe having a high M count gives you a greater potential of doing that. It's interesting to note that Asajj says think that it's not like they they know this isn't science. This is a misguided notion as to what the force is. It's a correlation at best. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's no causation happening here because we haven't seen the proof of one thing tying to another. Except we as the audience have seen the proof in the overall story with Anakin. Right. Well, we we're but a single instance does not prove okay right causation. So what we're saying there is sure okay he had, but he also was raised in the force. He was raised yeah, he was to trained, do these things trained, and trained yeah. in one. And he was already so old though, Kyle. You're right. He was the Eight. same. He's the same ish age as Omega at the start of the yeah the, yeah the whole thing yeah around there. Um, this episode is great. And I love it. And you want to talk about Harbingers? The first voice of the thing is that lady on the boat mm-hmm. saying hi. And Wrecker's like, you got a girlfriend. Or, 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 I'm Wrecker. I don't have any character. Um, <laughs> do you know who did that voice? Who? The l- same lady that does Asajj Ventress's voice. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. So get another Harbinger, another connector to say, oh, something's coming. <laughs> um. Yes, it's true. Yeah. It was also neat to go from a boat episode to a boat episode. Yeah, there's lots of boats. Uh, And that's because there's something beneath the water and we're not too sure what it is. And these things are dark and they're dangerous Mm. and they're scary, much like all of our feelings. So, And also like boats also um, and traveling on water is deeply connected to the feminine. Um, So uh, Omega goes off with Batcher exploring <laughs> yeah oh before that though hunter's like well we have to wait for the intel and in crosshairs like since when do we ever wait around for intel like <laughs> even crosshairs calling hunter into question here he's so he's so singly minded focused it's wild. and i think it's because he's feeling something because i think he's got a high m count himself oh yeah you you or like he's more sensitive yeah and so i think that he has to be one-minded in this matter Mm. and pursue a single prey and kind of be like a clever girl. I didn't realize it was another raptor in the woods. Um, (laughs) 
<laughs> reference Jurassic Park. He's not going to see what's going to hit him in the yeah. blind sides because he's been so single, single focused on the one thing. So yeah, it's going to come at him really hard. I feel we're, I'm very worried for Rick. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that, for, that happened for between Crosshair and, and Hunter before we go to the, <laughs> the cavern. So they go to the cavern, which is always <laughs> symbolically related to the feminine and also underworld journeys. And they, they accomplish this a lot with the lighting. What are you talking about, Marie Claire? It's just a cavern. That's what Omega says. It's just a cavern. It's just a cavern. And yet, you know, Batcher's like, oh, I'm there. <laughs> Batcher's like, this is Star Wars. It's never just a cavern, lady. <laughs> it's a journey to the underworld. And I highly recommend if you don't know what I'm talking about, go and listen to my underworld episode. It uh, talks about the symbolic motif of the underworld in Star Wars and kind of gives you a Star Wars 101 on psychological dur- journeys in Star Wars and how Absolutely. they represent symbolically on screen and in in the media. Yep. And this episode is giving us both of those things, the dark deeps that uh, of the cavern and as well as the ocean mm-hmm. that uh, draw at a primordial fear in humanity. So. Yep. And also, you know, symbolically talk about, you know, dealing with things that are deep down inside of you that you haven't dredged up in a while. Yep. Like yep. Cool, bald night sisters. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Of course, Ventress being inside of the cavern surprised not me because it, it it is what you need to do is to go down into the deep, especially in a heroine's journey, to meet with the goddess and to confront your own deep, dark feminine. And in this way, it's an initiation of sorts for Omega. And it actually ends up playing out quite like that in that there are trials and there are struggles, which she is shrug successful at uh <laughs> that and we'd been alluded to the fact that asajj ventress was going to be in this season, season yeah and in the last episode when fennec is talking to that individual at the very we were end both like there, oh it's ventress it's that clone wars motif that plays yeah and you're like okay here's the kicker and i'm like why did they do this and now i think i know why i think i know why oh do you want to save the that for... happen and in this episode yes okay you want to save that for the end? Sure. Uh, I loved the Jennifer Corbett uh, quote about Ventress's return. How she survived will be revealed in future content. Interesting. Future content. You think this is something to do with the future storytelling that they're working on? Well, I can only hope because this one was literally written by Jennifer Corbett. Yes. So this one was written by Jennifer Corbett and directed by Stuart Lee. This is Stuart Lee's third episode this season, and he's directed 16 episodes totally. Sorry, you're, you're I always wanted bored to finish by my her, interesting her points. quote. And, and so it's, re- I'm just saying, she wrote it. So when she's talking about here is directly relevant to this episode. So please finish it. Okay. For this story, we were thr- thrilled to include her and explore more of her unique connection to and for Omega. Interesting. That mm-hmm. seems to indicate that there's going to be more. Um, okay. I have a big theory about what she represents in this episode with both her knowledge and how she is constantly in this episode talking about the force and at its relation to nature. Mm-hmm. And previously when Omega was in Mount Tantus, I referred to her in relation to Vasilisa in that she had the doll and she was relying on her intuition to escape the sort of bad situation that she was in. She had a too good mother and of course the kind of like wicked stepmother situation and she escaped um, because of her intuition, which is what is represented by the doll. In this episode, I believe that Ventress is representing Baba Yaga, which is where Vasilisa goes to, to get fire, which is power. Uh, And also a version of initiation. When she goes to Baba Yaga, who is, this is, Vasilisa is a version of Cinderella that is from Russian folklore. Uh, Baba Yaga lives in a house with chicken feet, uh, rides around in a mortal and mortar and pestle that flies throughout the sky and controls uh, the forces of nature effectively. She is like the great mother goddess mixed mixed with a witch, mixed with a dark mother. (laughs) Um, And she contains all the wisdom of the natural world, including binaries like life and death and good and evil and et cetera. But she, 
And archetypically, she is a crone, much like um, archetypically, I believe Ventress is representing. But Baba Yaga, specifically the name Baba Yaga, Baba coming from Babushka, which is like grandmother, um, the shortening of it can just mean mother or elder woman. Um, Yaga comes from Uzeki, which is a sort of a, a bastardization of Russian um, or Old Slavic, which either means narrow, snake-like, or grass snake. Mm. So she is mother snake or grandmother snake. Isn't that cool? Especially given the stake motif on her uh, pauldron. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, this is, there's things that she learns, Vasilisa learns under Baba Yaga, uh, which I will go to into when we talk more about the trials. But I really think it's important that what Ventress represents is a meeting with a goddess, an elder, very scary woman. Baba Yaga is one of the most scary figures in folklore. And yet, <laughs> she is not here to She's, be scary. No, but neither is Baba Yaga. She tests Vasilisa. She gives her trials to complete, mm-hmm. but she never hurts her. No, not ever. And she gives her gifts in the end, gifts of power yeah. that she can take home and make her own life with. Yeah, we haven't seen those gifts yet. But there are definitely unless, some motifs unless here she in this un- episode. Unlocks it for her by even presenting her the option or the non-option. Hmm. I think that remains to be seen. We'll see. Right? But there's definitely a lot of similarities here with trials and tribulations and whatnot. Um, I do like I brought you over at one point and showed you two screenshots I'd taken. Yes. Um, they introduce the Bad Batch, finally, uh, uh, you know, they rush up. They see that Omega is is encountered or is now seeing, meeting Asajj Ventress. And Asajj Ventress comes out of the dark, right? She's coming mm-hmm. out of the cavern and she's standing in shadow in the darkness. And there is this uh, diagonal slash um, of change between shadow and light. And the Batch stands in the light on the right side of the screen. And Asajj is on the left. Then later on in the show, five minutes later, it's all it takes is five minutes in a 26 minute episode for a complete change to have occurred as the sun is setting and Omega's running off on her second trial of Mm -hmm. the Baba Yaga. Um, Asajj Ventress is now standing in the light and the the angle of the light between light and shadow is almost exactly the same. And the batch themselves are standing in the darkness Mm -hmm. and it just clearly shows to you, the viewer, hey, okay, this person is dark and scary. We don't know what their motivations are. Suddenly now we know what their motivations are. We know who they are and what they represent. And so therefore, therefore they're standing in the light and it is the others, the ones we thought we understood who are now standing in the darkness because we don't know what their new intentions are. And I was puzzled by this throughout the entirety of this yeah garbage of a fight that went on <laughs> i think it's just because there wasn't enough good talking that occurred right and i, fa- I finally figured it out marie claire mm-hmm. again with the end in sight they want to have Asage pull her lightsaber but there's no one else for her to be around for her to need they have to, even to pull they have to her show lightsaber. that it got to be yellow which is part of dark disciple <laughs> <laughs> in that she has been redeemed. Exactly. She has, she, there's there's a lot going on with Ventress from Dark Disciple. But yeah, she was redeemed. She came back from the darkness. And yep. like, the thing, the thing about Star Wars is that especially with Force users, death is all metaphorical. It's a metaphor for going into the underworld and transforming. And she's experienced that like multiple times Mm -hmm. in her own journeys throughout all of the different medias. And she herself being represented by a snake, much like Crosshair is represented by a vulture. It was an ice vulture. Mm. I found that out. (laughs) I knew that last season, but I like forgot that information. But she's a snake. So she's a psychopomp, which can go in and out of the underworld. And it seems like they're showing us these characters that go on these dark journeys like crosshair and like ventress representative with animalistic Hmm. psychopomps so like crosshair is associated with the vulture she's got the snake we have fennec 
as a fox. Like, it feels like these are like guides to other characters who go on dark journeys and show that it's possible to come back from the underworld where if you're a villain, you're on a villain arc, you get stuck in, you get stuck in this like darkness. And that's the symbolism of being on this dark path Mm -hmm. is it's not the end. You can always come back from it. And also it's a very easy thing to do when you have animals that represent a certain thing already in society. If yeah. you tie that animal to a character, it's like shorthand, symbolic shorthand. Your, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, the problem is folks is those don't necessarily translate from one culture to another. Yeah. So if you use a fox wily, quick witted and smart in, <laughs> in, in North American uh, culture and television, and then you put mm-hmm. the fox, Fox in a Korean or Japanese uh, drama, that is going to mean an entirely different thing to them than it will to us. Yeah, there's more of a, <laughs> a yeah trickster element in some some cultures, but there's also or like, like ravens, ravens in yeah. Nordic mythology versus ravens in North American mythology, a little or, bit different. So or indigenous populations, exactly. yeah, indigenous cultures. There is, um, I do think that Ventress coming back. It, it was interesting to see her come in as the harbinger because I thought she would be more of a guide and maybe she still will be because sometimes harbingers stick around. Yeah, it's right? possible. It looks like she's leaving, but she might come back. So Mike, she arrives and a lot of what occurs in, of the meat of this episode happens at sunset, yeah. which is the last bit of light before the darkness to come. And Asajj therefore in this episode represents that last bit of light before the darkness to come oh geez and what she has told to omega let alone what what she Mm -hmm. tells hunter and wrecker and crosshair about omega is is telling of where things are about to go I did a much longer post on my Patreon about Asaz Ventress and um, the relation to what happened in Dark Disciple and her being an animal bride and a fairy bride and what it relates to with Quinlan Voss, who still might be around at this point in the story. I'm not going to go into it because we didn't get any of that this episode, but if you're interested in my thoughts, that's on my Patreon. That um, sounds great. And I know a lot of people are excited and want to talk about Asajj Ventress because I don't know very many people that I so that I chat with on the regular that watch Bad Batch. And the people... There's, anyway, my friend Sarah Joy, who <laughs> I was on a podcast with uh, on YouTube for Star Wars and talking about mm-hmm. game mastering, she loves What the Force and watch and listens to this show because she loves the bad batch as well and so she watched the bad batch today and then was immediately talking to me on discord about (laughs) about it and she's like you're the only person i know that i can talk to about this because (laughs) nobody else i know watches this. i know it doesn't feel like there's a lot of watching but yet it's so there's like a lot of really interesting things happening from a star wars perspective yes they're 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 covering a lot of ground with certain things but they're doing things in such a strict linear plot fashion that Mm -hmm. sometimes i'm like could you have done more with less um yeah but what's funny was i said to her i said um i'm here for the forthcoming follow-up season which is just an assage only (laughs) series of runs and her her comment to that and anybody else i've said that to said it was immediate like i'm here 150 percent for it that would be amazing and they would have a lot to tell from a lost husband perspective with quinlan boss and another comment point point for me to that just from a meta pers- like not a meta perspective from your perspective but a meta perspective of like the whole the <laughs> yeah, show yeah, yeah, and yeah, what's yeah, happening yeah. behind the scenes yeah i was so impressed with the voice actor nika F- nika futterman's work on this because i loved asajj ventures in the clone wars mm-hmm. she was so good and so bitter and so angry and resentful and petulant yeah to take the character voice and devoid, like remove those emotional constraints and put her at 
piece. It, yeah, it and sounded a like bit, butter, but still her voice. A little yeah. bit like a little touch of condescension. Like mm-hmm. you don't know where I've been. And like, mm-hmm. oh, I, you're, you think I'm the bad guy? You haven't seen the empire. Like the way in which she put that character's new perspective and the new overlay of emotions was so skilled that if she can do both of those things, yeah, there is such a degree of depth for a, we, for us to follow on an Asajj Ventress story. Do you think that's the animated show we're going to get next? If we don't, I I would love a limited series at least. A limited series about Asajj Ventress? Oh my God, it would be so good. I love her new outfit. I love her hair. I loved how her hair looked like an adult version of Omega's hair. I loved how they mirrored each other. So she really looked like her dark mother in this episode. I loved it so much. There's so much I love about this episode. Yeah, absolutely. Um, The only things I didn't love was Hunter and the Batch just basically straight up being like, you're being a bad guy. Numbskulls. No, we're just numbskulls. <laughs> Except that as soon as they were like, no, you can't be like they were, she's training and they're literally in the audience bleachers cheering her on. <laughs> and like, you got this next time, says Wrecker. And then they're not allowed to be there anymore. And where are they? They're literally like, back on the looking. island looking through their binoculars and their <laughs> scope on their rifle to see what Go she's away, doing. Go away, dad. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and Ventress turns and Wrecker says, how does she know we're watching? <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. I will say <laughs> I laughed out loud. Yeah, that was and so my funny. wife was on a call and that was probably not the best time to laugh out loud. It was funny. Uh, no, uh, I also they did bring up tech with the text database. Exactly. Ventress is in text database from the Clone Wars. Um, well, they, the, they must the have some sort of tech pulled that he. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like the 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 you know empire database or whatever mm-hmm. that he had pulled from but they must have some sort of like image search because like how did they find her <laughs> in that i have no idea um so let's quickly talk about the tasks that are sure. being offered so in vasilisa the wise baba yaga gives uh vasilisa the task of cleaning her house and making her a big meal mm-hmm. enough to feed basically 10 people is kind of the task. And in the in the story, Vasilisa doesn't do it. I think I I I need to say that in that she doesn't do it. Her doll, her intuition tells her to eat fit heartily and go to sleep, have a nap, and everything will be solved. And literally, the doll does everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, much like the birds for Cinderella. Yeah. Or, you know, like the ants for Psyche. Yeah. Right? And then the next night, Baba Yaga is like, great, make me another meal, clean up the house, and also sort all these poppy seeds from these, uh, like, seed pods, basically. And to me, this reminded me of the second task, which was where it was, like, endurance related. Mm -hmm. She still doesn't have to do it. And in some ways, our heroine, Omega, doesn't actually have to do this either because she, in you know, entreats Batcher to take her to the top. If you look at Pabu, much like when you look at Tantus, it is shaped like the Freudian, uh, you know, consciousness with the subconscious and the superego and the different layers Mm -hmm. exactly the same. And so she goes into her conscious self to get the one white flower Mm -hmm. to bring it back. But she it is still not a task that she is expected to do. Not at all. And the third task is is her connecting with her inner feminine or inner power all of those things and she's not quite ready to do those yeah. things um but ventress <laughs> well she's like, not connected to her inner power and her inner self either because she couldn't re- ma- maintain stillness in the first challenge exactly either, right? yeah so she's not she's not ready to be initiated into you know adulthood for omega she's not quite there yet but she still has all of the potentiality mm-hmm. in there and the gift from Baba Yaga is the gift of the flaming skull, which takes care of her uh, step family and basically gives her her power to take care of herself mm-hmm. in that. And it's all, you know, a metaphor for growing up yep. in the most horrifying way possible because her family burns, her step family oh, burns yeah. to death. It's so weird. Jack gets a golden egg laying goose and, and, uh, and <laughs> Vasilisa, Vasilisa gets a gets burning a skull. Burning skull. 
yeah uh, to burn her mother stepmother to bits <laughs> yeah exactly but in the scene that's on the ocean ocean connecting to femininity but also rebirth from a you know symbol perspective you know she's not able to do it she's not connected with nature with her own nature yet yeah right but when ventress stands up there she calls this cool little s- school of squid yep of glowfish of glowy fish but they have little tentacles mm mm-hmm. mhm and then unknowing, she calls something deeper from the deep. Yeah. And it is the darkness from within that she is called forth from the subconscious. And she has to confront that. Mm-hmm. She has to confront the darkness, much like how Vasilisa had to confront her stepfamily who was so mean to her and so evil and sent her to her death. Like they tried to kill her by sending her to Baba Yaga. Um confront this darkness and make peace with it yeah and that is the secret to growing up is understanding your own darkness integrating it which is the state which was what you need to achieve in your maiden phase or any of these phases that are on the more feminine side or the integration side of uh the psychological life motifs yep or archetypes and she you know touches out reaches the squid kraken <laughs> face and sort of like becomes one with it it's an alchemical union Mm -hmm. in this moment so it's symbolic of coming to terms with your own darkness and it makes you more powerful in the end yeah so we've gotten all the like what's interesting maps but omega's not quite there yet well what's interesting though is that omega is already there you think so yes because while Asajj connects with the beast from the deep. She connects with Batcher. Yeah, and all the other. No, she connects with Asajj. Uh, Before they get on the boat, yeah. Asajj confronts her. And mm. she tells Asajj, um, uh, like, you're still here. You haven't left yet. Right. And that tells me I can trust you. And Asajj knows immediately. Mm. Crap. This person does have all of the takings. She knows and she has a feel she's connected with right. the force already because she's connected with me. But it's it's about the different phases that you're in. Right. Right. So I do think that like, yes, to your point. Yes, absolutely. Because also like Batcher, her, like she just has her own way of doing things. And that's also like really key to what Ventress is saying with the M count thing, Mm -hmm. which is we don't really understand what it means because Mm -hmm. you have to walk your own journey. It's the Joseph Campbell, like no one can walk the journey for you. You can't follow your own, like you can't follow any other, anybody else's path to the force or to your own self. Mm -hmm. Cause that's the meta. That's a big metaphor of star Wars. Yeah. And this is about Asajj. The fight in the beginning, Asajj would have just killed them. Yeah. Instead, she took their weapons from them and fought them hand to hand. When one pulled a knife, she took the knife from him and threw it into the stone. It wasn't until they got their guns back that she pulled out the lightsaber. That needed to happen so that we could all see this is not the same Asajj Ventress. Yep. Her hair is different. Her clothes are different. But mm-hmm. that's not enough. And then it still isn't enough because they have to show us three times, right? Yes. New clothes, new hair. That's step one. I mean, new light. that's so classic though. New clothes, new hair. <laughs> exactly. New lightsaber. That's yep. that's another step two. step two. Didn't kill any of the Batchers. Mm-hmm. Fought them to to put them in like to disarm them and make not, peace with the Kraken. Exactly. And then yeah, not kill mm-hmm. and dis and dispatch the the dark the darkness from the depths that you know that she's fighting. Mm-hmm. She's constantly fought that because she had embraced it for so long to connect with the beast. To the point where it puts her, sets her down gently and leaves happily, knowingly connected to another individual mm-hmm. and say, goes away. That is just as much the lesson that this Asajj is teaching Omega yeah. as it is this example that she's showing us of who she is now. Yeah. I love this reintroduction to yeah. to Ventress. It was really <clears throat> great. I called the three trials balance, endurance, and connection. <laughs> yep. Staying still, going up, going, uh, reaching out. That's mm-hmm. what I called them. No, I love that. That's and of great. course, the t- small kid has not figured out stillness and has not figured out connection. connecting with the unknown. Yeah. Connecting but she, with the unknown. Or the darkness. Definitely. Connecting with the darkness is also something that she, I don't think, because yeah. she, she's so young, she doesn't, 
She hasn't experienced much of that darkness herself to be able to connect with it. Ventress leaves with a warning. Um, you got to leave. <laughs> you can't stay here if I found you. Yep. Other people will st- will find you. But just in the way that Omega held out a hand for Crosshair, mm-hmm. Crosshair holds out a hand for Ventress. Yeah, I like that a lot. And... And then they left that damn boat in the water and they soared away in the Marauder. And I'm like, that boat? They need to we be met the lady. They don't have too many. That's they the have... lady's boat. And, and you and I both said it was just a rental. <laughs> I know, but we know the lady <laughs> no, because I know. she's friends with the Crosshair. And she was also played by Ventress. So, I mean, the actress. Uh, they gotta get that boat back. They gotta get the boat back. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, I also really loved how, like, so what does this M count thing mean? And it's yeah. like, well, it only means... If you want me to take her away, you know, you want me to train her on this path, like she's got the stuff, but it doesn't feel like that's her journey or what she wants. No. Right. So that's also really, really important in this whole conversation Mm -hmm. is what do you want? And I also don't agree with the idea that she would have to leave. No. Ventress could stay. (laughs) But I, it doesn't, what, but Ventress literally tells us. What you want is irrelevant. Mm. That's a line she says in the episode. She says, what you want is irrelevant. You're not as safe as you think you are. I mean, yes. That's Harbinger stuff right there. To do with (laughs) Pabu and all of those things. Yes. And also, you don't have a choice but to grow up. Yeah. You don't have a choice but to deal with the world. You're not safe in your little village. Those are part of those life archetypes yep. it's the maiden phase going into hero is about leaving the village to go and save the galaxy or save the kingdom yeah it's, it's literally that is the step is you're no longer protected by your village and your mentors yep. and your protectors and yeah like she's archetypically exactly what you would see which is she's being hunted by a predator which is of course hemlock mm-hmm and she's being protected by a group of protectors. But she's more skilled. Th- Sorry, I got excited. <laughs> she's more skilled than that. And she deserves to step into being a heroine on her own. Oh, and she absolutely will. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. the what, if, if you can't control what things are going to happen and where things are going to go and the rain that's going to fall and the darkness that's going to roll in, you can at least control how you react to it mm-hmm. and how you see the events as they unfolded. And I can't think of a better way to end this episode than by saying that was fun. Because it's exactly what uh, Omega says after the whole tentacle debacle. While sitting (laughs) on the Marauder, she flops down and says, well, that was fun. And everyone, Asajj Ventress included, gives her the same exact look. Yeah, exactly. I also liked how Crosshair was the one to like reach for Omega and and welcome Ventress onto the boat and or onto the ship. Man, there were so many good moments about this episode. Uh, somebody asked me if I was going to be talking for six hours. Uh, <laughs> we yeah, we're almost ninety minutes in, and I haven't even talked about the two people I I chose to pull oh. pull out of the credits. So I don't know if you want to hold on to your hats, and we'll talk about that for three minutes, or sure. should we let people go? I mean. You, they've been warned if they they really find the behind the scenes stuff that boring but i hear people really like it kyle so okay so let's talk about joanna goldfarb who is the post-production director mm. um she's been with lucas for lucasfilm for two years now and a post-production director is an interesting role any thoughts as to what you think it might be is it like the credits <laughs> No. (laughs) So, you know, when the show is done and the director's like, that's a wrap and everything's done. That's when the post-production director takes over. And after having done an audio drama from a professional perspective recently, I can see why this role of a post-production director has been created and exists in like all forms of media now. The post-production director is not a creative role. Um, But it is, as the job description says, a stressful job with long hours, tight deadlines, because and you manage the post-production budget as well. And guess what there isn't at the end of a show? Budget. No budget. (laughs) You've used it all up. Usually there's not much money left for the post-production component. 
And the post-production director is the last person responsible for the production, well after all of the other creative roles have stepped aside and been done. And they liaise and work with the uh, accounting side of things to make sure that there's money left over. And they go and they make sure that they schedule and they get all of the other remaining assets that might have been overlooked. So if there's a a background scene that they need to have or assets Mm -hmm. that were not acquired that need to be done for the finished project product, they're basically there to clean up all the loose ends for to stitch all the all the stitches closed and make sure the actual thing looks real pretty. Get the credits on, get the get the after credits, get the post show initiation component done. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times they're then responsible for liaising with the marketing group and putting together all of those runners, the trailers and other components that are right. done and, and not necessarily doing those things, but just but coordinating, getting, it. Yeah. having budget set aside for those things f- of the budget that's left, ha- making sure that somebody is designated to pull the clips that they want to put into those components and use the music that they need. And do we need to get any retakes or are still retakes outstanding from any of the voice actors? Or do we need to tighten up anything else? And is there anything once the production has wrapped that still needs to be tidied up from a production standpoint Mm. and they're hired at the very beginning and then they're involved in the entire process that's that's the post-production director are they also responsible for the uh like if say like uh, a show is translated and they have to get the right you know I would think like, that the hiring of those components, but then doing and the dubbing and whatnot is is offset, but they're probably still responsible for it because that's all post-production. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that's, I mean, a job you never knew you could have. Yeah. There you go. And Joanna Goldfarm has been with Lucasfilm for two years doing exactly this. Wow. In their animation group. So she probably joined for like just the season because, I mean... Yeah. How long ago was that? I don't know. I didn't check to see. She does. So the post-production director doesn't get a lot of IMDb credits. Right. Because they don't usually put that in. Um, So it's hard to find out more about her. But she's like a really cool human being. So um, oh. really interesting. Seems like a really exciting person to like be involved in all of this. And that was my person for uh, Bad Territory. Okay. The person I'm picking out for the Harbinger episode mm-hmm. is none other than... And this is a really cool one. Nicholas and Anastasiu. Nicholas Anastasiu. Okay. Nicholas was on the crew. He was part of the crew for the Phantom Menace and the Clone Wars. Oh, my goodness. In fact, uh, or Attack of the Clones as it was, right? Happy 25th anniversary, Nicholas. And even got to have a cameo as a Jedi Knight named Nikanas Tasu in Attack of the Clones. I bet you Pablo named him. (laughs) <laughs> it sounds a lot like his own name so i don't know <laughs> it's like what's your name uh we'll uh use this in this jedi name thing that's on aol online right <laughs> and give you this boom you're, you're your character here's your jedi name how cool is that he's a jedi knight <laughs> That's cool. In the show. Um, He was the associate editor for The Clone Wars and then became the role I want to talk about, which is the lead editor for The Bad Batch. So what does a lead editor do? Edit it? (laughs) Yeah, from a holistic perspective. Actually, they work out what needs to be animated and how scenes are then pieced together. Mm. So all those washes, the Star Star Warsian fades Mm. that we talk about, He's the one who puts those in and directs when they occur, but also like how much time before that happens at the end and close of a scene and how much is lead in for the start of the next scene. So that's what the lead editor does. He uh, and then once the animation work has been done, he will arrange the final footage, preparing the rough cut and then makes revisions for the final cut which then gets sent over to the director and the producer for approval. So he puts everything together based on the storyboards that have been laid out, puts it all in. But of course, the storyboard is just a picture. He has to segue all of the time Mm -hmm. and ensure that it aligns up. Yeah. Not only gets the, to the time yeah exactly gets to the time not yeah. only does it not go too long but also not go too short yeah and that's principally what his job is it's, it's just so interesting because like animation editing is probably a little bit different than film editing 
from a construction perspective because they have to be so much more thoughtful with what they're editing to save money or what they're animating to save money yeah and not over animating so they're not wasting basically money and that's why they work and i talked about the asset individual the people who control the assets mm-hmm. too where they build all of these set pieces mm-hmm. and they add like every time gonkey's in a thing that's an asset that they have and they have all the different angles for gonkey mm-hmm. so that when they put him in a scene they know what he's going to look like and his assets of his sounds are tied into that too i would imagine the lead editor is just as responsible mostly for those that interstitial tissue which is the end of a scene camera Mm -hmm. pan across the flat uh, ground or the ship taking off how much of the ship Mm -hmm. do we watch leave do we watch it go all the way to hyperspace or does it go only for two seconds he's largely responsible for making those decisions oh interesting yeah yeah. And those are the two individuals that uh, I came up with. And he's been with Lucasfilm a really long time. Yeah. Like since the mid 90s, because like, you know, Phantom Menace has been around since the mid 90s, really in exactly. production. Right. So, yeah. So thanks for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, this is a lot of fun, Kyle, talking about these episodes. I really enjoyed them from a symbolic perspective, uh, especially the last one. It really, really made me happy. And I'm so, so, so happy to have Ventress back. It makes me happy that she exists in the world. It also tells me exactly what I've always known about Star Wars, that, you know, dying is just a metaphor. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't even care how she came back. I have thoughts on what might have happened, but it really doesn't matter because it's all a symbol. It's symbolism. Mm -hmm. It's a metaphor for our own struggles with darkness and our own rebirths. We don't need to see it happen because when it happened for Darth Maul to watch him come back, I was actually not really put off by a lot of that. (laughs) And turning into a spider monster and then getting new legs and then (laughs) going crazy. And yeah 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 but this was awesome yeah and I, this is awesome what i want is for her to have a journey of exploration and find quinlan i think that would make me really really happy oh yeah because he's her boyfriend <laughs> he also uh committed a taboo from a folklore perspective so he needs to uh, make up make it up to her all right Much of what we know about her comes from Dark Disciple, which was, of course, taken from um, Katie Lucas's scripts. So George Lucas's daughter, who wrote these scripts from the Clone Wars and were turned into a uh, into the novel Dark Disciple because we never actually got to see those scripts, the uncreated versions of uh, those those stories, which involved Quinlan Voss and her uh on some adventures and him falling to the dark side of the force her going after him her saving him her dying in that book mm-hmm. dooku shoots her up with force lightning and she falls into a magical uh dathomir pool <laughs> and is reborn and is reborn yeah and as she comes out she says well that was fun well that was fun <laughs> And this was fun. Yeah. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for to you, Kyle, for all of your insight. Huzzah. And uh, we will be back maybe next week, maybe the week after, depending on how things play out a little bit. And uh, I've been having so much fun with this. So take care, everyone. Cheers. Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. Our music is Orchestral Music by Christy Carew for What the Force. You can support the show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash whattheforce. We'd like to thank all our patrons, especially those who love and are obsessed with What the Force. John, In Wild Space, How Rude, Anna Perez, Neil, Christian Luca, Carly Ann, Scott C., and Susan. Support the show by wearing the Force with our merch. Like and subscribe on YouTube or leave a five-star review on iTunes iTunes or other pod apps. It helps others find the show. Connect with us on Twitter at WT4 Show, What the Force Podcast on Facebook. Our website is whattheforce.ca or the Discord link is in the liner notes. Feel free to reach out and start a conversation. Cheers. <laughs>